Uh, good morning. Welcome to Stonebridge. Glad you're here. We are in the middle of a message series called Silly Little Love Songs. You just heard one. Uh, I wanted muskrat love, but we got um, this one. Captain and Tennille. Everybody remember Captain and Tennille? All right. Absolutely. Love will keep us together. No, it won't. Captain Tennille got divorced last year. I think about that. Are you kidding me? How's that possible? Captain and Tennille, you, right? Just uh, trying to do some love stuff this month. And yesterday's Valentine's Day. It's the weirdest Valentine's Day for me ever. I had sent Linda down to see our grandkids. And so it's me and the dog. People said, what'd you do for Valentine's Day? I said, whatever I wanted. <laughs> so uh, he had kibbles and bits. I had Fruit Loops. <laughs> Best we got. So it was really weird. She's having a great time. And I just got this message. See if I can find it. Just sat down. I'm at church thinking of you. XOXO. I don't know what that means, but I think it's good. <laughs> Truth is, it takes more than love, doesn't it, to keep a marriage together? Every marriage is either growing together or growing apart. If you're not growing closer to your husband and wife right now, you're growing apart. Not by a lot, but just by a little. So today we're going to take a look at what, help, what are some things that will help us keep our marriages growing together, right? So Proverbs 24, verse 3 says, the house is built on wisdom, becomes strong through good sense. We need those two ingredients. We need wisdom and good sense. And it, I would contend that we have very little of that anymore. Not a whole lot of wisdom, not much good sense when it comes to marriages. Marriages don't automatically grow. It takes a lot of work, hard, hard work and effort, it takes knowledge and wisdom Marriages are what you make it. If you're willing to put in the work in, uh, it, no matter what, you ha can grow a marriage. Um, no matter what it's been like up to this point, you can have a fantastic marriage. I want to give you some things that we need to do. First of all, we need to pay attention to each other. Pay attention to each other. When you give somebody your attention, you are giving them your time, which is saying, I'm giving you my life because I cannot get any more time back. I can get more money, but I can't get more time. So when I give you time and attention, I'm saying you uh, are incredibly valuable to me. The truth is, that's how you fell in love. You started paying attention to each other. You fell in love because uh, you began to pay attention. If that ha wouldn't have happened, if you hadn't paid attention to each other, you wouldn't have fallen in love. 1 Corinthians 7 says, marriage involves you in all the nuts and bolts of domestic life and in wanting to please your spouse, leading to so many more demands on your attention. That's what marriage does. It leads to more demands than you had when you were single. In fact, Paul says, the unmarried can spend in, uh, can spend in becoming whole and family instruments of God. I'm trying to help be helpful and make it easy as possible for you not to make things harder. So he says, if, if, if you want uh, to know, it's a little easier for single people to be devoted to God than it is to marriage because marriage takes a lot more work and effort than just being single. It does. Do you remember how much attention you used to give your wife or your husband before you got married? You write little notes, bought flowers, talked on the phone for hours. You were saying, you have my undivided attention. In fact, you thought about each other all the time. Now you don't think about, as, you don't think about as, each other as much as you used to. You maybe take each other for granted. All of a sudden, other things get a little bit more attention. There's babies, bills, careers, hobbies, sports programs, things. Just, I mean, most of all that stuff's really good. It just diverts your attention. Remember when you bought that first new car and you just couldn't believe it? You got a car and, and you, you, you washed it all the time. You vacuumed it. You laid down the law. Nobody's eating in this car. Nobody's, no messes, no nothing. We're, we're going to take care of this car. Then after about a year, there's Taco Bell wrappers everywhere. There's McDonald's french fries that have been there for months, crammed down the side of the, right, the seat. And you're just like, how did this happen? Well, you stopped paying attention to it. 
You just said, oh, no big deal. That's one French fry. That's no big, that's no big deal. And then right after a little while, it's a mess. So why should I pay attention to my spouse? Because you love that person, and love means I'm going to pay attention. So first of all, are you paying attention to each other? Which means i got to carve some time out. More than just a Valentine's Day kind of deal. I need to carve some time out so that we can pay attention to each other. One of the best things Linda and I did, we really made it a priority in our marriage. We we're going we're to spend a, you know, some time. We're going we're gonna to continue to date each other. And we didn't do it every week when the kids, all that kind of demanding. But there were moments when we were just like, here's a sitter, we're going to go. And we, we just made it a priority for that. Later on, when they got, grew up, we began to uh, take vacations without our children, which, by the way, was wonderful. <laughs> I cannot even tell you. You're like, well, no, don't bring them. <laughs> Seriously. I, Pay attention to your marriage. There's Disneyland. Go for it. Yeah. But schedule a cruise for you and your spouse after that. Send them home. Somebody, fight. Mickey will watch them. Somebody will do it. <laughs> Just find some time. Number two, not only do we need to pay attention, we need to make some adjustments. Every season of life requires that. Kids come along and there's some adjustments. They start growing up and going to school, and there's some adjustments. You change jobs, maybe even cities, and you make some adjustments. A while back, a lady wrote to Dear Abby. She says, Dear Abby, I'm 40 years old. I would like to meet a mature man my age with no bad habits. <laughs> Signed, Rose. Abby wrote back, Dear Rose, so would I. <laughs> Takes a great deal of unselfishness in a marriage. We have to adjust to each other. In fact, you can't be un, if you if you're gonna if if you can't be unselfish, you you're really gonna struggle in the marriage thing. And I talked to couples. I said, "Well, you're gonna have to." You, well, well, here's the problem: you're being selfish, and here's the problem: you're being selfish. But I want to do it. I can go out if I want. I would go out with the guys. I'm going out with the girls. I'm gonna make these demands, and I can do whatever I want. Whoa! 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 I'm not saying you can't do that, but I'm saying, whoa, whoa, if I begin to demand my rights in marriage, this is my stuff, my money, my car, my, whoo. First John 3, 18 says, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. I don't know why it is the longer we're married, the less we think about each other. Ephesians 5, 21 says, honor Christ by submitting to each other. That seems a little confusing, right, to us guys who grew up in the church when we said the wives are to submit to the husbands. They, the preacher just kind of ignored the rest of the passage. Wives submit to the husbands, which means I'm the leader and you make the adjustment. Preacher said so. Amen, preacher. <laughs> First time guys paid attention in church for a long time. <laughs> what? What? She's supposed to obey me? Hmm. I'm buying the CD. <laughs> so here it says, honor Christ by submitting to each other. Which means, again, if I am the leader, I am the lead submitter. I'm going to take the lead in adjusting. It might be as simple as this, watching TV. In our home, we only have one TV. It saves our marriage. Because if we had two, I'd be downstairs and Linda would be upstairs. I'd be watching what I want. She'd be watching what she want. Then we go, hmm, how's your evening? I, I don't know. Pretty good, I guess. Right? It's just, you know, it's easier for me to say, let's just do a little of adjustment. Because I'd rather spend time with you and watch Chopped <laughs> than drift apart. Linda's down in Texas this week. With you know, last few days, she comes home tomorrow. She they went up to Waco, which she uh, there, there's this TV show that she watches, some sort of um, fixer upper show. Yes, yeah, and and 
and so they have a fixer-upper store where these people, and, it's like, and so she texts me, she's like, I'm going to the fixer-upper thing. Magnolia, something or other. Like, what? And all I can think of is, glad I sent her on the plane and not with a truck. <laughs> more, more adjusting. But the real test of love is not telling each other that we love each other. It is making the decision to do that. It means me more patient, more kind that I want to seek the best for the other person. Romans 15.5 says, May God who gives this, patience, gives this patience and encouragement help you live in complete harmony with each other as it is fitting for the followers of Christ. So, we're going to make adjustments. We're going to pay attention. Also, we're going to show affection. Romans 12.10 says, Love each other with genuine affection, which applies to me that there is some affection that's not genuine. It's phony and fake, not real. Take delight in honoring each other. You probably would agree with me, it's a lot easier to fall in love than to stay in love. And we sometimes, how do you rekindle that fading love? At one time there were some feelings. Jesus talked to the church about this. In fact, he said in, in, the, in the book of Revelation, at one time you and I, we were so in love with each other. I don't know what happened here. He encourages the church to remember, remember, remember what it was like when we first fell in love. Revelation 2, 4, 4 through 5 says, but I had this complaint against you. This is Jesus talking. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Remember, turn your focus back on your spouse. Just so you know, love is not a feeling, but love can create that. Love is a choice. It's a commitment to put the other person's best interest above my own. Here it is. It, love is a, cho is, is, is a choice, to decision to put the other person's best interest above my own. Other than that, it's not love. It might be lust. It might be sexual arousal. It might be attraction, but it's not love. If love was a feeling, then... then but God couldn't really command me to feel that way. So you make a choice to love someone, to show them affection. Feelings always follow actions. It's easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. The greatest enemy of romance is not anger, it's not bitterness, and it's not another person. The greatest danger of romance is busyness. We just get too busy, and then we get too tired. Sidelines are affection for each other. The University of Nebraska did a study and discovered that every great marriage has a common denominator. It's really simple. They spend time together. And if you get nothing else, here you go. It's free. Every great marriage, the husband and wife spend time together. I know, that seems weird. Huh? Huh? Yeah, you spend time together. So I don't care how dedicated you might be to Jesus, if you don't spend time together, you will eventually drift apart. So dating each other, spending time, vacationing to get all that kind of stuff matters. And sexuality and spirituality are closely related. God wired you up that way, that you are more than just a body. You are a spirit. And when God brings together you both on the spiritual level, there's, a, there's this intimacy. Here you go. There is this intimacy that the world doesn't get at all. The closer I get to God, the closer my wife gets to God, the closer we get to each other. I know that the teaching oftentimes is in the church is anti-sect. No, we're not. We love it. He gave it to us. It's awesome. There is no doubt about that. The Puritans got this bad rap. The people who came over on the Mayflower gave us Thanksgiving. For so long, we were told they were prudes. They anti-sex, sexually repressed people. Not true. Quite opposite. Puritans consider sex as one of the greatest gifts that God can give people. In fact, they consider lack of affection as a major sin. Dr. Leland Wright, a professor, writes, a Puritan wife in New England felt that her husband was neglecting their sex life, so she complained to the pastor. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> now, uh, he didn't want to hear it either, so she went to the whole church. And here's the church's decision. They kicked him out of the church. 
until he got it right. Just think about that. What if Stonebridge... <laughs> oh, that's the church you get kicked out of if you don't make love to your wife. Hmm. Tell me more about that church. <laughs> what? Very important. We show affection. We also need to be affirming. Every one of us needs to be affirmed. It's kind of how we're wired up. We, we fell in love with a boyfriend or a girlfriend that affirmed us. Who's going to fall in love with somebody who doesn't do that? And yet, when, when the longer we're in relationships, the harder it is sometimes to be affirming. One of the God-given roles he gives to husbands and wives is I, I am to be Linda's biggest fan. I am her cheerleader, and she cheers me on. By the way, when she does that, I can knock down any wall. I can fight any battle. I can go through. I can't. I really can't. But when we begin to kind of, mm -mm, you know, it really, the more defeated we are, building each other up is, po is powerful. And when somebody believes in us, we can grow. Remember that when you, maybe you were in school and a teacher believed in you? just believed in you. So I think you can do this. And all of a sudden, you kind of begin to believe in yourself. Maybe a coach who uh, saw some talent there uh, uh, just said, you know, I, I, I'm gonna, you're starting. What? You really got some talent for this. Maybe it was a drama coach who spoke in and said, you know what, I've been watching you kind of, uh, you're a little tentative, but I think you can do this. And uh, just... Here you go, and, and brought something out of you that you never thought was possible. One of the most important things we can do to keep our marriage together is to raise the value in each other's lives. Proverbs, or Hebrews 3.13 says, you must warn each other every day, or you must encourage each other every day while it's still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin, hardened against God. Proverbs 12, 25, worry weighs a person down. Would you agree with that? <laughs> An encouraging word, though, cheers a person up. And so you're saying, I don't know, I can't, there's nothing I can appreciate. I don't, I can't, I can't even appreciate anything about my husband. Well, maybe the fact that he's still there is a place to start. Building each other up is powerful. It is my job to bring out the best, not the worst. That never works. So I can be either a dream builder or a dream buster. I can either be a nag or I can start to brag. I think one of the most important things, and to wrap this all up, is that, that we need Jesus to, to be the glue that sticks us all together. All these things are great, but, but I really say I think that one of the best things we can do is to grow closer in our relationship with Jesus. One of the things that I, I'm just going to throw this out there and see, maybe you can try this. If, if you're feeling like things are kind of drifting apart, this may sound really difficult, but a lot of married couples don't, Pray together, and I would encourage you to do that. Just pray together. And maybe you maybe you never prayed out loud, never did that, uh, so it's going to be a little awkward. Um, but I would encourage. Maybe it's just at the meal time you pray for each other. Just if you would pray for your wife, and if you would pray for your husband, it will bring you closer. If you will read the Bible together. Do a little devotional time. Maybe that's you know, you've never done that before. Then, then you can go to a small group together and kind of start there. So you don't have to manufacture this. And you don't like, have, you know, like, where should we start? One of the best things that Linda and I ever did while we were still dating is every morning we got up and we would read. We'd, we'd meet on campus and we'd like here and, and, and we would read uh, a, a chapter from the book of Proverbs. There's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs, so if you've got 31 days in the month, you can do one a day, so whatever today, 15th, so do the 15th, 15th proverb, and read that together. And then you just kind of talk about it, and we did that uh, for months. It was a wonderful way to kind of start our relationship together. I don't know why we did that, it just, we just did. One of the best things we did. Maybe start, you pray together and pray for each other, 
it'll, I think it'll move you closer to each other. Have you ever had a plant that you got a little neglected? All of a sudden you notice it like, oh no. It's still alive, but it's not really good. And so you decide, oh, I should probably water it. And you water it and, and maybe there's a little fertilizer that goes with that or just some care, move it to a brighter, I don't know, what do you do? And all of a sudden that plant perks up. This is what a health, this is what it's supposed to look like. And maybe your marriage has got to that spot where it's just, it's just been neglected. It doesn't look very good right now. But there's still hope. There's still, it's still alive. It just needs a little care. So you need to pay attention to each other a little bit more. Maybe, maybe show affection to each other. Maybe there'd be a, 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 just a, a time where you... Uh, And all of a sudden, that loving care that you bring together with begins to grow a healthy marriage. Say so that, you know, it, we think that love will keep us together, but there's more to it, isn't there? In fact, the Bible says that these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. We've talked a lot about faith today, and our, putting our faith and our trust in Christ, growing closer together in our faith, loving one another, making decisions to do that. And hope is that ingredient that says, if, if I just pay more attention, a little bit more care towards it, I, it'll grow and thrive again. Those three things are important. Next weekend, we're going to talk a whole lot about love. 1 Corinthians 13, we can't get through it in one weekend, so we'll take two weekends to do that. For the next weekend, first part of 1 Corinthians 13, it's love chapter, love is patient, love is kind. You know this one, right? Uh, so join us next weekend for that. Let's pray. Thanks, God, for this uh, moment in which we pause for a second. And maybe the best thing we can do today is um, just the best thing we can do today is to hold hands. Just to take delight in honoring each other and show genuine affection. Please give us the patience and the courage, the courage to grow together so that we may not just say that we love each other, but that we show that by our actions. So, at this moment we pause and ask that you would restore to us the joy of our salvation and the joy that it was when we first fell in love. In Christ's name.